got an introduction for the next speaker. So this is the speaker. This is the person introducing the next speaker. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Last year I came to this conference and I was given two gifts. One of them was the opportunity to share my testimony as a recovering addict and the, the impact that the prison ministry has made on my life, St. Paul and Pray for us. The other gift I was given was meeting this next speaker. I met her in Beaumont at the Catholic con at the Kobe conference, and I was looking a recovery sister eye to eye. All I can say is welcome your seatbelts and welcome Amanda Cassidy Trail. Before I would finally quit using drugs to change the way I felt. 
The parole board told me that I was going back to prison. I no longer was able to call anyone. Nobody came to visit, and my name was never called at mail call. My family and friends were just as sick and tired of me as I had become of myself. I found hope in a 12-step meeting that was brought into the county jail, and on October 15, 2018, I decided to surrender and change my life. I can still recall the stench of the jail pod. I remember a sense of recognition, this feeling that had settled in my spirit that I was going to die. When I was sentenced to go back to prison, I was able to see myself for the first time in a long time. Here I was in a high-risk pod in Bear County Jail again, having been told by yet another judge that I had a problem and another parole officer telling me there was nothing more they could do for me. I was consumed, even when locked up, with manipulating people on the outside to give me money or commissary so that I could continue to numb my pain. I saw the insanity that was playing out in my life, almost as if seeing it from another person's eyes. I had lost the ability to feel human. When I arrived in TDCJ as number 02179902, a couple of weeks later, I learned that I would have to change everything, including who I surrounded myself with, even within the walls of a prison. I did my time differently. Instead of focusing on the outside world or on who I could manipulate to make my time more comfortable, I focused on me. I dreamed of all the things I could accomplish if I truly did change my people, places, and things. I made a list of things I could do when I got out and prayed over it constantly. I knew the only way I could change was if I got on his path instead of my own. I reached out to others for guidance, and they offered their experience, strength, and hope. They say that when you get to prison, you find out who your real friends are. For me, I had burned so many relationships to the ground getting there that I could count on three fingers who those people are. Two of them were my best friends. One was my dad. I began exploring faith through snail mail conversations with him, and he would send me assignments that I would read diligently and respond with, and we began to foster a beautiful relationship together. I began attending Catholic services on my unit, and while I can't remember who the volunteers were, I do remember their spirit. I remember falling back in love with the Catholic Church and all of its pomp and pageantry, learning why the deacons and the priests wore the garments that they wore and wore them where the readings came from and gained a deeper understanding of why we do the things we do. I learned how to rebuild myself in the foundation of a faith I had given up on as a rebellious teenage girl. I learned how to find gratitude in the coldest, darkest moments of that prison. Like being grateful to be able to hear again when they gave me hearing aids after I lost my hearing at 30. Or when they gave me a cell with a window so I could see the outside world again. Or that one time my monkey let me use her radio and I heard music for the first time in months. Or that fateful Mother's Day weekend when my dad surprised me with my kids and visited. The shift in my perspective from focusing on all the shame and guilt to focusing on hope and faith was paramount to my healing. To see me in his image, looking at the light that shined through rather than the crack, it gave me the push I needed to make it through those moments where despair threatened to suffocate me. And in a fashion that only God could do, he made sure my last day in prison was just as hot as my last day homeless. Four years ago today, July 22nd, 2019, I spent my last full day in a Gatesville prison. It was 100 degrees outside that day in Gatesville, but in that prison cell it felt like 120. Recently, there's been a video of a Houston grandmother going viral where she's seen baking bread in a brick and metal mailbox. Do you know what TDCJ units are made of? We were baking bread. We were the bread. I can still feel 
my brain suffocating from the heat. It's so unbearable, you can't even eat anything. But my focus was on the future. I knew it was only a matter of hours before I would finally walk out of that prison for the last time. I was reminded of exactly how far I had come and where I would never go back to. I was terrified of what was ahead of me, but I was filled with a courage I had never known and determined to go forward as boldly as I could. The next day, my dad was at that gate waiting for me. And in a true Cassidy fashion, we took the long way to Austin. But that journey outside the prison walls began July 23rd, 2019. When I made parole, I made the decision to not go back to San Antonio, where my family were and where I had spent most of my active addiction. I needed to change one thing, and that was everything. I dug into my recovery and started attending 12-step meetings every day really dug into some step work and being of service, learning to let go of old belief systems and thinking patterns while implementing principles into my life so I can build a healthier future for myself. I learned to grow out of the animalistic behavior pattern I had survived in and began to experience feelings again, like love and compassion. I became trustworthy and dependable. I built a new life for myself. I have beautiful relationships with my sons today. I've gotten to watch my oldest son graduate high school, and I got to watch him graduate Marine Corps recruit training. I have a home today that my 16-year-old can come to and live in and be safe and thrive. I have a relationship with my parents and my siblings today where I talk to them all the time to the point where I annoy my mother. <laughs> I have developed an amazing career serving others with similar thorns and helped to remove and help remove barriers that stand in the way of them living a full and fulfilling life. I met the love of my life and got married. We bought our home together and we have named it the Hope House. Every weekend our home is filled with family and friends. Love and laughter, coffee and food. Our families have blended effortlessly together. Now my two children have become my five children and my granddaughter. I was able to vote for the first time in decades. I have a driver's license and a car. I have insurance. <laughs> I even pay taxes. <laughs> To the outside world, I am a responsible and productive member of society. I have been given all of the material things and the responsibilities that come with them that I could have ever dreamed of having. But the true gift, the one thing nobody can take away from me is my faith. I have a relationship with God today that is the most intimate relationship I have ever had in my life. He lives in me and I feel Him guiding me along. He shows up in the people I surround myself with, the places I go, and the things that I do. I sense him in the laughter of my children, the embrace of my husband, and the pride of my parents. What I found is that I also see him in myself. I have finally, finally found that God lives in me, and I see his reflection more than ever. There's a lot of literature in my favorite 12-step fellowship that I just love. This quote always stands out in my head when I think about how different my life has been. We are often amazed at how things work out for us. We are recovering in the here and now, and the future becomes an exciting journey. If we had written down our list of expectations when we came to the program, we would have been cheating ourselves. Hopeless living problems have become joyously changed. Our disease has been arrested, and now anything is possible. I thought a lot about what I could say to maybe motivate you all to do a little more, to make the lives of our brothers and sisters behind the walls better. I thought about how I could maybe get you to advocate for the climate control in the TUCJ system. 
system or to push back on digitizing the mill. But then I remember the conversation I had with my dad last year at the Colby conference that was really poignant, and I thought I'd share that instead. Last year, my father stood up here and shared about his organization, Brave Resources. The night before, he was sharing with me what he would say. The one word that stood out to me the most was offender. I refuse to be defined by my worst mistake. I invite you all to change the way we speak to and about our brothers and sisters. Call them by their name. Call them residents. The word offender is offensive. So I offer this choice to you because our brothers and sisters are humans that don't deserve to be called by their worst mistake. 